We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yes, we are recording on Tuesday at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This is this is going to be our uh, regular time for the foreseeable future. So, oh, okay. Oh, there you go. All right. For, I could for this go week. a little earlier than one. I could go oh, earlier okay. than one. I could, I could do that. I could maybe move it earlier than one would be okay with me once kind of in the middle of the day i would like to maybe do it earlier than one all right on the regular but we'll discuss that at a later day somebody was just asking today whether or not we were going to do the hangout still at 11 o'clock at night eastern time and the answer to that question is oh no sir we are not <laughs> no it's not, not definitely not, not in, at the 11 o'clock eastern time thing that's no. that that's not happening for for now no <laughs> i guess we could maybe do like a patreon hangout like oh sure maybe once in a while or something like that we could do I'd that. be down yeah so other podcasts that do that yeah so we should yeah. Figure, figure out coordinate things that. are a changing around here but yeah. although not very much and, and especially no. if you're listening to the audio only version really nothing is changing nothing is changing at all and speaking of audio did yes. you get the jurassic park box set uh well i got it but i decided to gift it to my dad for father's day ah uh, so so yeah so I, when are you gonna we, borrow the disc i'll, I'll, I'll borrow it at some point to hear the dts no, okay well i'm giving my review okay I wasn't even sure if you were going to watch it. So, so I did. Go. I got it uh, Sunday, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's the limited edition 4K Ultra HD block. Yes. You know, doesn't even have a Blu-ray version. <laughs> it's not the, but the, oh, does it not? I didn't even notice no, that. There the special are, features are on Blu-ray discs. Yes, the but... special features are on Blu-rays, but the other ones are all 4K okay. Ultra HDs. So, which is fine. Um, wow. Okay, so first of all, this is by far... The best movie. This is the first Jurassic Park. I haven't seen the rest of them yet because there's four movies in there. I'm not going to watch. I might watch the middle two, but I'll probably watch whatever the last one is called. I can't remember. Jurassic World. That's the one. I'll watch that one probably sometime this week. But you could watch the first opening scene with the the Velociraptor cage. They're trying to get the Velociraptor in there. And it's like suddenly you have a great Atmos demo. Okay. It literally puts you in the, like, when the camera is in the cage looking out, Uh the sound of the Velociraptor is behind and above you. Right. And the people sounds are in front of you. I mean, it is all around you, and there's lots of deep Mm. bass, and it's very loud, and everything else. Surround effects are amazing. Now, this is all DTSX, so... It is. Who knows what's going to happen in the future with all that mess that we talked about last week. But, wow. Finally. Like, I recalibrated... Not only, not once, twice, I think maybe three times last night because stupid Odyssey editor app won't download the curb, the curve that you got, that you already set up. Like Uh I click on uh it and it makes me take a new measurement. Huh. I could not get it to down, to just say what's there. It was like, Uh oh, you have a new receiver. Let's go ahead and. Well, my my receiver is too old. I can't use the Odyssey editor app, so I'm not I'm not sure what's going yeah, on. Yeah, so there. I think every I mean it's fine, but it was the the app was weird. Like it hmm. it I I was using it in the home theater to get everything set up, and then I went to the computer, which is probably fifteen feet away through a yeah. wall with the uh, that wall may or may not be concrete block cinder block. Okay. At least part of it is. The rest of it's not. Um, and it kept saying it was losing connection to the receiver. But it's not even a direct connect. I thought it was through your network, isn't it? That's they, they what I thought too. So to I was very. Con- router? Yeah, I know. So I ended up leaving the phone right outside the door. So and I kept having to walk back and forth because that was the only way. I, every time I brought it to the computer, it stopped working. I, it just may have been a fluke. Yeah. All right. I'm not. I'm not going to talk about. Them. But the inability to download the curve you currently had and you had to take a new measurement was irksome because I had just recalibrated. Well, and sure, yeah. It made me recalibrate again. So it was fine. Uh, I, so I don't know if the recalibration did that much. I do have, <laughs> and you and I will talk about this afterwards, but I do have a really weird dip. And not only is mm. it a dip in, in the measurements, but the curve they're going for is not a hump to kind of 
fix it. Oh, okay. It's like it's like the curve is also a dip. I'm un I was trying to adjust the curve and it's not that fine of control. Whereabouts though? It doesn't have numbers on it. So I would say upper mid-range, like between the crossover and the mid-range and the tweeter. Maybe okay, yeah, because that, that. Odyssey uh, by default uh, includes, uh, they have a thing at two kilohertz, a little notch. That sounds exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They have a little notch at two kilohertz uh, intentionally. Uh, that That's part of the Odyssey, uh, even in the flat target curve that's included and that's what confused me because i switched it to flat and i'm like dude what yep. uh, what's this little no, that's curve, that's this one little of the curve. things people used to try and get rid of with odyssey pro and yeah. uh now you do have the option with the odyssey editor app to um tell it to just not correct above a certain range oh. but by default that is the that is the target curve it has a, it has a notch at two kilohertz that's i was pretty amazed at how uh all over the place my measurements were before uh -huh. odyssey uh -huh. versus after but okay back to the movie because first of all Jurassic Park, the movie. Yes. I used to make fun of this movie because of that one table scene, you know, where they're all sitting around the table. It's like, who can be the, the, the can say the most serious, scary thing out of everybody? You know, at first it's Malcolm with his, you know, oh, okay. life will find a way. And then it's the girl with the, you know, we have no idea what's going out there. And, and then it's the guy with whatever. And I'm like, dude, everybody tried you know, trying that out serious. Watching this movie makes me realize how good of a director Steven Spielberg is mm. because his directing makes it so that you're like, what this person's saying is very important and very true. Right. And then you think about it, you go, <laughs> that is like no human on that entire movie ever made any sense about anything whatsoever. <laughs> like none of it makes any sense at all. Like just monumentally stupid things <laughs> like the lawyer is the only person who is clearly the bad guy yes. he gets eaten first the only person that's making any sense in this movie has not aged well as far as i've aged and i look back and i'm going you people are stupid and deserve to get eaten but the sound in that movie is phenomenal <laughs> all it right it is so good that was the main thing that was what we were looking to looking to find out if you are looking for a demo disc okay I mean, if you could buy the whole set, and if you just watch the first couple of minutes of that movie, you're like, okay, I got my money. You'll back. understand that immersive audio is a, it can is capable it is of being all a thing. over you. It is okay. you are inside that cage. It's insane. So very good. All right, nice. this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com. Leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. YouTube.com slash avrant. You can contact us directly rob at avrent.com his twitter is at first reflect i'm tom at avrent.com my twitter is at avrent underscore tom well, I, that wasn't one breath but it kind of felt like it all right yeah, it was pretty so, good. <laughs> let's pretty uh smooth that was pretty smooth it's been a while <laughs> so we're going to start by thanking our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week you need to support the podcast in some way one way so you can do that is by going to www.avrent.com clicking clicking on the clipping clicking on the buy us a cup of coffee link and which will take you to a paypal donation site you can use your credit card or your paypal account to send us money and if you do we will mention you on this podcast so we want to thank zachary for his donation this week your donation will go into our coffers to help us uh pay for things uh-huh thank you zachary we appreciate the donation we also want to thank our 61 patrons over at patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you sign up for a monthly uh, subscription, if you will, to our mm -hmm. podcast, which will monthly take out whatever amount of money you deem that we are worth per month. So anywhere from a dollar up to infinity. So we want to thank our 61 patrons. Yeah, that is patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up. And thank you very much to our 61 patrons. I'm, I'm smack dab in the middle of coffee number two. Can you ah. tell? So we all, if you can't support the podcast financially or if you just don't want to, that's fine. But if you would like to support us in some other way, just let us know what it is. Nathan told Power Sound Audio that he heard about them from us. He's very happy that we mentioned them because he was having trouble getting a hold of a replacement calibration microphone for his anti-mode automatic bass EQ system. Have we ever talked about that thing? Because I don't know what that is. I, I, anti mode has come up once or twice, but not for a long time. Right, right. I don't. Yeah. And so uh, it was automatic. It was automatic. How you just plug it in? And it does its thing. It is. Yeah. So uh, actually, I might mention the Velodyne SMS one uh, right. coming up later in the podcast. That was another system which is no longer available. Right. Um, but there was that uh, SVS had an Odyssey based one, didn't they? 
at some point was was that SVS or it was SVS they did have an yeah. Odyssey one I don't know that had multiple microphones though I no just no that one. one just had the one but yeah. uh, but th there were a few of these uh, outboard automatic uh, base equalization systems uh, anti mode was one of them and it, it still exists but it's not really readily available in the US except through power sound audio there you go uh, it turns out Power Sound Audio is an authorized importer for anti-mode products, and they hooked them up fast and gave, at a great price with great service. So thank you. Yeah. Jason Good to hear. got his user review for his SVS PC2000 posted on SVS's website. It's dated 6-12-18. If you'd like to look for it, though, you could just come to the website, and we will link it up. And he gave AV Rent a nice, a very nice sh shout out about uh, this, I guess. I didn't read it. So it was yeah, that was that was in the review there. We were we okay. were prominently mentioned. So thank you, Jason. Chris, we also want to thank who is offering a, one of our lucky listeners an Insteon Hub giveaway. So Insteon Hub is a, a home automation majigger box thing, and mm -hmm. I've got uh, some people who are interested. So oh, good. I, I will be. Uh, it is uh, more th uh, than than two and uh, less than twenty, but uh, okay. so far, so your odds are looking real good. Good odds so gonna... far, and I I didn't see any uh, entries for that come in at the question at AV Rant nope. uh, website. So everyone has been listening to the uh, very convoluted and confused instructions that we gave out last week that we figured out on the fly. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the instructions are: if you want it. Send me an email at tom at avrant.com with your reason for wanting it. There you go. And yeah. you want to email Tom directly at his yeah. email address. Yeah. Everyone who has entered so far did just that. So that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. All right. In the news, if you want a measurement microphone specifically designed for headphones and earphones, well, Mini DSP now offers their ears dummy head, which resembles... I mean, it, it looks like a pair of ears on a stand. <laughs> so it, it looks like the type of stand that you would hang a pair of headphones on right. when not in use, uh, yes. except that uh, a, a little lower down and on either side, uh, there's some plastic ears just yeah. sitting there. Anyways, that's, a, that's that's 200 bucks if you want that, if you want to measure that's your right. headphones, which I yeah. do not. <laughs> Odeon Cinema Group in the UK has announced their partnership with Dolby to bring seven Dolby Cinemas with Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos and reclining seats to seven as of un yet unannounced locations. These will be the first Dolby Cinemas in the UK. I mean, we have those here because I think I've got one like around the corner. You've got quite a few in the United States, but yeah. more by far more than any other country. All right. I've never been in that one because it's real expensive. But the date for when they'll open has yet, hasn't been announced yet. Germany will also be getting their first Dolby Cinema in late 2018 in Munich. And I figured that's where they'd put it because, I, I, I mean, Hamburg is like the only other town I can think of. Hamburg. <laughs> is there, is there, is there, that's it. All right. Uh, joining the Spain, Netherlands, and Austria as the only countries outside the United States and China with Dolby. You don't have any? Canada has none. Oh, no, I'd have goodness. to drive down to Washington State. That doesn't seem fair. All right. Wait. I know. I, I I want us to get some. Uh, China has the second most to the United States, although still right. far Don't fewer. Think. But uh, yeah, United States and China was it. And now we got Spain, Netherlands, Austria, and coming up UK and Germany. So that's good. All right. We've got some uh, comments here from our listeners. Joseph on Twitter, after our talk last week, talk last week about wanting to delay a 12 volt trigger signal, Joseph mm -hmm. suggested a little $17 12 volt timer delay circuit. There are full instructions on the manufacturer's website along with helpful YouTube tutorials showing how you connect it and program it. It's mostly used for car applications, but it's a standard 12 volt circuit. So there's no reason it couldn't be used for a 12 volt trigger for an audio amplifier. So 17 bucks. There we go. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, it's a, it's a very small. I mean, it's just a little circuit. They show it here next to a well. That's a dime. I thought that was a quarter at first. It's even smaller than I thought. <laughs> Showing it next that's to small. A, How do they even put the port in there? <laughs> well, there's, there is no port, so there there are just some bare wires coming out of the thing. So oh, okay, if yeah. you are connecting this to a regular mono, you know, three point five millimeter jack, you're going to have to snip that off and probably use a uh, a butt splice to uh, put the wires together. You'll need hmm. two of them, one one going in and one coming back out. But uh, yeah, that so normally this is used in cars for like things like uh, setting the delay on when your little overhead lamp in your car will go out or come on and things like that. But oh, yeah, uh, I guess that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I knew your, this device had to exist. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it had yeah, to. Your, your daytime running lamps or whatever, you know, they stay on a little bit after your car turns off. So that that's just yeah. a delay. So it's a little circuit like this that's being used. So yeah, there is no reason why you wouldn't be able to, you know, just majigger that into your system to uh, add a 12-volt delay to yeah, your at least audio amplifier. Small. 
Yeah, you know I, what somebody should do is buy that for seventeen dollars. Yeah, put an enclosure around it and That's sell right. it for fifty bucks. <laughs> Some that, people will buy it for sure. That is a money making opportunity, right? The forty forty nine ninety five. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did want to mention audio, the website to uh, to just Jay from last week uh, who was asking about this. It it occurred to me later on, and and actually we had mentioned it in a previous episode long ago, but I, I don't know why I didn't think of it again. Uh, which was that I'm not sure if he's making use of his zone two right now. Right. But very often you can set it so that when you turn on zone two, it sends out a 12 volt trigger. That's usually an option when you have a have a zone two output on a higher so you end. Put receiver. delay on zone two and then have the yeah. Zone so two don't have there. any speakers connected to zone two sure. uh, because you would actually need to because if you turned it on and then turned it back off, that would send the twelve volt trigger to turn it off again. So right. that wouldn't do the trick. But you could set it so that on in your Harmony remote or whatever that there's a delay and then it turns on zone two after the receiver has fully booted up and that would send out the twelve volt trigger to your audio amplifier and then just do the reverse when you're turning things off. Turn off zone two and it'll turn your amplifier back off so if you're already using zone two for something of course that won't work but uh but that that was another thought yeah carl for anyone who'd like more information about the thx deep note after the recent public release of its original hand-drawn mu- uh, sheet music carl shared a podcast episode from Twenty Thousand hertz there's a lot of audio podcasts out there, there where are. they talk all about its creator dr andy moore so you can go listen to that I have yeah. no problems plugging other people's podcasts because I don't really care. Certainly not. Um, what well, wasn't my favorite format for the way they did their podcast, but hey, that's that's just one man's what was opinion. Their format. Uh, well, it sounded very much like they were trying to be a like a half hour documentary, but in audio form, and they took commercial breaks, and it it just came across a little bit strange to me. But, okay, whatever. whatever. But whatever. Uh, you, you, Listener uh, the beware. Information, the information was cool. And uh, yeah, the thing I didn't know uh, at all about the uh, THX Deep Note that I learned from this podcast um, is that it, it was basically that he created a program because it was all synthesized notes. Mm. And he created a program to do the whole, you know, moving around, changing the... That thing. Yeah. But it was generated randomly... So the thing that we're hearing, like, literally only existed once. <laughs> it's like every time he ran the thing, it gave a slightly different result. And he just picked the one he liked the best? It was actually the first one because that's the one they took and showed to George Lucas. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then, uh, and then they, they couldn't ever replicate it. <laughs> so, wait. It, it, it's hand-drawn sheet music because no one knows exactly what happened yeah it's it's not like defined it was it's random that's why there's just lines that's why there's not actual notes (laughs) that's right so they recorded this thing one time yeah i mean he recorded it multiple times but they literally just used the first take that was ever recorded (laughs) that's crazy that's cool all right, David went, just wanted to confirm that the Asus BW16D1HT internal 4K Blu-ray drive is the one to purchase if you want to back up Ultra HD Blu-rays using Make MKV. Mm-hmm. Can you just say yes to that so I can go on with this question? Anyways, he made the mistake of buying the external USB version at first. When it didn't work, he opened up the case and discovered that it's actually a Pioneer drive inside. So there you go. Who yep. knew? Uh, one that cannot read a BDXLs or Ultra HD Blu-ray discs. So that's why the model doesn't work. He doesn't have uh, an available internal 5.25, uh, anyway, a five and a quarter inch uh, drive bay for in his computer case, but he simply put the BD, uh, BW16D1HD in an external USB enclosure and it works great. And so there you go. You can take the external, the internal drive, put it in an external box connected by USB and it's fine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it is odd that the model number that looks like it's just the external version is not even a drive made by Asus, but uh, okay. Yeah. Guess that's what they do. All right, Chris unfortunately has a bad experience to share with us. I hope not. He decided to go with a Screen Innovations Black Diamond projection screen. That's not what I have, is it? No, is definitely not. No, that is a uh, ambient light rejecting screen as the Black Diamond from oh, Screen right. Innovations. Okay, anyway. Yeah. Once it was all said up, he noticed a mark in the middle of the screen that he only notices during bright scenes, but it's still a distracting imperfection nonetheless. He called Screen Innovations. They first said that they never heard of such a thing, and then after some back and forth, they said there's no defect, nothing they can do about it, and no sort of exchange servicing or refund was offered. Given the very high price of the screen, Chris was expecting a lot better service and performance than that, so he's sharing his rant. Dude, 
don't get me started on bad service today, okay? <laughs> so I bought a phone for my son who uh, I'm trying to find the name of the stupid company because I've got it open ah. here someplace. Uh, I bought a phone for my son and it was a, here it is right here, uh, from a company called Tech Venture. Okay. I have already bought a phone from Te Tech Venture before. It's They're unlocked okay. phones because that's yeah. all I use. I just buy phones outright. So sure. I bought an unlocked uh, Nexus 5, not 5X, 5 for okay. my son and it's a little old and it's a little slow and it's a little crappy and it was okay because it's not my phone now deal with it <laughs> well my other son's phone self-destructed and he wanted uh, a, a new phone and that phone that i got the five that i got for my son which worked just fine it's just slow and crappy uh was no longer available it was 100 bucks at the time so i got a nexus 6 for him okay. which was 150 bucks 160 bucks which is not a little bit more but not that much more so i got that for him well, he went away and blah, 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 blah. I, I turned it on and it was locked to AT&T and I used T-Mobile. Ah, so I tried okay. to unlock it and I couldn't unlock it. So I called, I went to the AT&T store and they're like, we can't unlock it. You got to do it online. Mm. Like, oh, so I called the company and they're like, oh, we just unlocked it for you. I'm like, no, you didn't. Like, oh, no, we did. Just next time you, you, it'll be unlocked. I'm like, no, it won't. They're like, yeah, it will. I'm like, no, it won't. That seems so, highly unlikely. So if AT and T can't do it, how come you can do it? It just seems stupid. So I, you know, of course it wasn't unlocked. So I just returned the thing. I had to pay return and shipping, which kind of sucked. Eh. But then I ordered two more of Nexus sixes from them because there's no place else to order them. Mm. They're literally the only game on Amazon that I could find. So I ordered two more from them, and those two were fine. So okay. it's just sort of like this: the, the, the CS, the CSRs, the, the customer service representatives on that you talk to. I think their job is just to get you off the phone. It, that seems to be the case in a lot of a lot of situations. It's like it's like stall until the person gets frustrated and hangs up on you. I mean, I think that's their instructions. So I feel you, Chris. Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, I mean, there's absolutely no reason. I mean, what is? I, I would love to know what this imperfection is. A mark yeah, the yeah. Because he, when he Could said a mark, a I'm not spot? Yeah, I don't know if it's a dark mark or a bright mark. I mean, he said it only really shows up in bright scenes, so I'm thinking maybe it's a bright mark, which yeah. is it that is like not a defect. That's kind of what that screen does. It hot spots that screen yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, it has a like I know they say it's only a 1.4 gain, but the way it does the ambient light rejecting, it was a bunch of coatings and layers and all kinds of right. stuff. And uh, very often you'll get sparkles on it. You'll see. It, yeah. Like it, well, if you that, shift... that's one of the reasons I don't like those screens. I know. You know? Yeah. I, I'm not a big fan of the Black Diamond, and it's a very expensive screen. I'd, If you were looking for an ambient rejecting screen, I'd point you to the Loon Visions. I, I like that one better. Um, the one that yeah. Seymour sells uh, works, but has really narrow viewing angle. <laughs> Like, right. Well, yeah. I, I, I mean, when I said that's one of the reasons I don't like those screens, I didn't mean black diamond screen and whatever this. I mean, ambient I don't like ambient light rejection screens in general. I yeah. I just rather have it be washed out than yeah. have hot spotting during other times. So uh, we don't know what the, what the issue was, and we're certainly not blaming the victim here. If that's what you want to call this well no so, i mean a I mean, little bit something better than this than like well, nothing we can do about it bye <laughs> well uh, yeah you know and, 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 and i remember uh it, 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 not to give best buy love because you know i don't want to do that uh, a long time ago <laughs> i bought a, a, a dvd player when dvds were brand new i got an expensive one mm -hmm. it was like a jvc this is way before audio Holics and all this stuff and it would pause halfway through the disc and before it went to the new scene is that and the I layer switch yes yeah, except yeah, yeah. that Literally nobody knew what it was. Okay, okay. So I kept returning it and getting new ones. Oh, the early DVD players just did that. They they took a second on that layer switch from. Layer I would one to layer I would two. tell I would I would talk to the sales people. They're like, oh, I never heard of this. Right. No one's ever complained about it before. I'm like, it's driving me crazy. My wife, she was so mad. <laughs> she was so aggravated. Who cares? It's one second delay. It's a big deal. I'm like, it breaks the flow of immersion. I am <laughs> taken out of the. And so I ended up returning it, returning it, and eventually buying something cheaper that also did it. And uh, it's just so stupid. It's just so stupid. But they did at least not give me a hard time about returning it. All right, let's get, like, we got to get going here. Heath wrote back to say that so far his latest SVS amplifiers, the third and fourth ones, haven't failed on him yet, but he's still paranoid to mm -hmm. answer some of the things we wondered about. This is a guy whose amps keep blowing. Yes, his neighbors like every too. couple of weeks, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, he did say that dual SB 4000s are overkill for his 2200 cubic foot room. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. But he wanted those to be his forever subs that he could stay with them, even if he moves to a larger room in the future. SVS told him the 4000 series doesn't use fuses, so that's not an issue. No, it seems like it might be part of the issue. Uh, and lastly, when the amps have failed on him, there's still some sound coming out of the subs. They don't go completely dead silent, but you can't make out what's playing. It's like the sub is on, but it can't be turned up any more than what uh, one or two clicks on the volume dial would normally be. So it's almost as though the, the whole game structure yeah, is blowing. That's, that's, that doesn't sound at all like what I expected him to say that it sounded like. I know. So, uh, I, if I were SBS, I'd want those amps back. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I yeah, would ship yeah. them back to me and to figure out what the heck happened. Because it that does sound very strange. Very it is. Strange. It's very odd. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. In that case, I I almost want to say that it, you know, last time we saw, there's no way that Yamaha could have anything to do with it. Like, I, mean, I, just, I don't think that the Yamaha. But that oh, I mean, it's a Marantz. Yeah, thing, a way, or whatever it the was. The pre-pro. Yeah. The pre-pro. Yeah. I still right, don't so think anyway, it's that. <laughs> I still don't either. But, yeah, whatever. Let's get on to the questions here. Nick says he was planning on getting a 13-channel Denon X8500H at some point in the future, and he was hoping that it would let him use 9.2.4, so that that includes front wides. Mm -hmm. you, you and Rob both. That's me. But now there's the news that no Dolby isn't going to allow any upmixers for other than their own uh, for Dolby signals, and the Dolby surround upmixer doesn't put any sounds in the front wides. Furthermore, as we talked about a little while ago, we are seeing some Atmos disc releases with the masterings being done strictly as channels, not as objects. So once again, the front wides would remain completely silent. Mm -hmm. Being able to apply DTS Neural X was at least a, f a way to use front wides, but Dolby's mandate might eliminate that option. Plus, Neural X currently maxes out 11 speakers, not 13. That's right. So what's the what's the workaround? Maybe set your sources to decode all audio internally and only output 7.1 PCM. You better be able to use whatever up mixer you want on a PCM signal, right? But then you'd manually have to change the audio output of the source uh, if the source is actually Atmos or DTS X. That that is all all true, all correct. Yes. Um, all, yeah, yeah. And but you, what you can do that you don't have to. Uh, you, you could actually have it output. Because uh, no, that's not necessarily true either. Is it? Because they're not going to let you use anything on any Dolby mix or any Dolby Atmos mix. Because most of the time, no. on this, you have the choice of Atmos or like seven point one true whatever, and then you should be able to split it out from that, right? Uh, so I mean, for, so for actual Atmos or actual DTS X, usually the choices. I mean, the, the choices are either you just decode it as Atmos or right. decode it as DTS X, or you could have your player still decode that into seven point one PCM because right. it is a seven point one PCM signal. Then with the Atmos or the DTS X metadata on top of that, but if you take it, if you take your player out of bitstream mode, then it'll just decode internally and send it out as seven point one PCM. So you could take a genuine Atmos mix, turn it into seven point one PCM, and then apply a DTS Neural X up mixer to it. I, sure. I guess you could do that to actual Atmos, although, I mean, usually for actual Atmos, you're just going to be like, well, I hope they used objects in the floor <laughs> layer and that my front wides actually get some action. But either way, you are hearing that Atmos mix as it was intended to be heard. Sure. So I'm I'm kind of okay with that, even though it might result in your front wides not having any sounds in them. Uh, but it's for everything else. It's for all the older formats, right? So going all the way back to regular Dolby <coughs> Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, Dolby True HD... <coughs> All of those Dolby formats, you can't apply, or supposedly, I mean, this hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it was Audioholics reporting on uh, right. a thing that was sent <clears throat> out to manufacturers that, that hasn't actually had any public effect as of yet. Maybe it'll never happen. Who knows? Maybe they'll change their mind. So, I am, uh, I am, I'm not even say hopeful. I'm expecting that this will never take effect. <laughs> it's it's possible. Yeah. I I I'm very I find it very unlikely that we're going to have them decide that they're going to use this thing and then and know. then on top of that we yeah. had that fellow who wrote in saying one of the Sound United reps says said uh, I mean they confirmed it they said there is this mandate but that it only applies to future products and not existing products and the X8500H is an existing product so I don't know maybe maybe it, maybe won't, it won't be won't, impacted. Yeah. Uh, and you'll still be able to apply DTS Neural X to a Dolby Digital 5.1 yeah. signal as you can right now, today. That's, that's how it works. Or you can just get the Jurassic Park one with DTS X and enjoy some of the best Dolby Atmos I've ever heard. There's that too. Not, but not Dolby Atmos. But let's you know, just, let's just assume that 
it it all goes the 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 way we don't want it to go and the firmware update does affect the x8500h and it does become so that if you're playing a dolby digital 5.1 signal you can only apply the dolby surround up mixer to it could there be a workaround besides the changing it into 7.1 or 5.1 pcm because that is an option it's just the slight hassle of you manually having to do that at your source device right right um so i mean really the only alternative there would be to do one of the wacky two multiple res receiver things, multiple yeah. receiver setups you'd, you'd have yeah. to use the zone 2 output of the x8500h uh that will send the full hdmi signal to a second receiver and on that second receiver an older one that if the firmware updates do you know go back to previous uh, uh, units then just don't update the firmware or assuming that it doesn't affect older units but the x8500h is new enough that it does or whatever the scenario might be that right, causes right, right. this uh, yeah it, it would have to be a multiple receiver setup and then you could you could do it that way with two receivers right. <laughs> so dolby uh, just did the work to make these 13 and 15 channel processors possible they provide discrete 9.1.6 test tones on their own website, but then almost everything they do results in front wise being silent <laughs> all the time. Why? Can I be dead honest with you, dude? Mm. You're like a handful of people who even know what front wides are. This is true. <laughs> there's that. And then there's, there's that. I mean, I, 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 if they mixed it into an app absolutely object based thing yes then front wides would theoretically get some use oh yes during I mean, during actual atmos content i mean sure. that that is not dolby's fault yeah I mean, dolby made it entirely possible this is some studios deciding right that this is how they're going to mix and master their content instead of making things into objects in the floor layer and sometimes well they have to be objects in the overhead layer but sometimes they're mixing them as though they weren't objects they're just like <sighs> no four fixed positions and that's all we're going to do you know, to I, move I, sounds we're going to do it with uh, volume levels not with actually using the object which is like moving a mouse how hard is that but well whatever. i mean I, I, this, <laughs> my in my brain this this is what I see. I see a crusty old, you know, uh, 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 surround sound mixer guy who's been doing this job for 20 years. Yep. Didn't really want to do surround when surround came around. <laughs> got used to it. And then Atmos is like, now we're going to make it easier. We're going to use this computer. Yeah. He's like, I'm out. I'm not using any computers. I got the sliders. I'm good. No, wait. We've just No, just put the speakers there and give me a slider. I could do it. I've got You're my like, potentiometer knobs and that's as far as I go. That's it. I'm good. A joystick? No. Yep. Yeah. Too difficult. Yeah. Well, and I, 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 I and I'm being I, mean, I have no clearly I have no idea what's actually going on, but that in my mind is what's happening. Oh, so it, what I, does that mean? That yeah. means that there's a there's going to be a a period of time of growth right. where we're going and, and it could just be the other thing too like we've got this We've got all these, you know, we need an Atmos thing for this. Well, we don't have all the stuff set up. I haven't been trained yet. Okay, well, just make do. <laughs> that could be it too, right? I suppose, Just yeah. do what you could. Just do what you can. Okay, well, I got 13 speakers in here. I guess I'll just use them like I normally do and then go from there. So I, I think that there's going to be a mixture of these things. I mean, clearly, clearly it's it, it can be done correctly and it will be done oh, yeah. correctly. It's oh, like yeah. anything else. I mean, how many times have we seen... Uh, new technologies come out when they first come out. The implementation from the studios is pretty, yeah, lackluster. No, so I mean, it's least. it's mostly the Dolby surround up mixer because I mean that is from Dolby. They're like, yeah, the Dolby surround up mixer. It does doesn't use front wides, and it it if you had uh, the speakers that are in between the center speaker and your front left, and in between the center and your front right, because there are speaker positions possible in an Atmos setup, it won't put anything in those either yeah. using the Dolby surround up mixer. And they explained it that. They don't want to mess with the front sound stage. That they're worried that if they mess with the left, center, right, that things could go awry, uh, and they and they don't want to do that. So that's been their justification. Uh, yeah, that's that. I mean, I guess that's the why. That that's what they decided to do. But the Atmos isn't Dolby's fault, so can't yeah. blame them on that. So we've talked about the trial, and this is a completely different topic, by the way. Yes. We've talked about the trial and error process of measuring multiple subs in multiple seats and gradually adjusting positioning and or phase or to try and achieve the most uniform response. But all of that assuming is assuming the listener only has one mic. Mm -hmm. What if you bought three or four measurement mics? Is there an inexpensive or at least reasonably affordable way to plug them all into one computer and see their responses in real time uh, all in one graph? You'd still be using trial and error, but it would be a lot quicker if you could see all the seating positions at once and in real time 
time, wouldn't it? Question mark, dot, dot, dot. Uh, this is the Avelodyne SMS-1. I used to own this. Uh, it actually collected so much dust that I think I... If you lived in St. Petersburg, you had a chance of getting in a Goodwill because I think I just threw it out. <laughs> I tried to give it away, but nobody asked for it. So you would have been the dude. So what you do is I think it had, because uh, there's the SMS-1, which has had one microphone yes. and the little boxy thingy or whatever. But there was the, the expanded set, which I think could do up to five. That's right. It was the uh, Velodyne Mic 5, which was yeah. a five microphone package and then a little box in the middle. But... Uh, so I'll, I'll let you explain, but I'll, I'll get a little bit into it because it's not quite what he was asking for, but but it was a five microphone system. Right. So what this does is it actually sends a test tone. You you plug it into your receiver, uh, both video and audio. And the video was like composite. I mean, it was like yes, that's so right. Yeah, it was the yellow cable. That's, <laughs> it, that's was it was so bad. And then then you turn on that input, and then you would see, you would hear a. Mm over and over again as it played a test tone mm -hmm. the microphones would pick up that test tone we go into the box the box would then analyze it and then put up on the screen the curve that it was being exhibited in your room right now that curve was like one third octave smooth which means it smoothed okay. out like all of the stuff that you and it was also much it only see. one graph you didn't get five yes. separate graphs because no. it was summing the five yes. mics together so you were so what this what the velodyne mic five package was doing um so like you know when you run odyssey and you take multiple measurements up to eight but then what it's doing with that is spatially averaging it. It's saying, okay, this is the response I'm getting it from position one through position eight, but then it averages those responses right. and gives you one output graph and then tries to equalize that. This was doing that like five measurements simultaneously, but it right. still was just averaging them into one. So it's right. not quite what we're looking for, which is to have you know, five actual different measurements so that you can see if all five of those measurements are uniform with one another. We don't want to just sum them all together. We know that's going to happen in the end. So what you could have done with this is you could have put the mic in one spot, one mic in one spot, mm -hmm. taking the picture of the graph, mm -hmm. took another spike in the second spot, take a picture of the okay. graph, the third spot. You could have done it that way. Okay. Yeah. And then that would give you the different, the diff at least an idea of what Although these you different can graphs. Basically like. still do that now. It's a little bit slower. The SMS would have been faster because it was real time. It was real Real time and it was actually kind of fun and you could you could yeah. tr play around with your cue values and your uh your parametric eqs and and just you know really adjust it to your heart's content and you know it, at the time it was super duper cutting edge and everybody was super right. excited about it but it's a little bit moot because you can't get that thing anymore you would have to find it on ebay yes and and it isn't exactly what he's looking for in no, that it's not. It, it, yeah. it is still just one at a time it just happens to yeah. be real time instead so i don't have uh, an answer directly that is, you know, you can connect four microphones reasonably and affordably because there, there, there are systems that'll do that, but they're thousands of dollars because right. they're, they're professional monitoring stations. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, it exists. Uh, or there's the JBL Arcos system. That but sounds cheap. That right? is you get one of those thousands of dollars. <laughs> you get that. Get that. Any Best Buy. So you're basically asking for something that does exist, but at a much more affordable price. And, and I, I mean, I might just be ignorant of it existing but i i don't know of it um people I have mean, it, it's the it's not just the microphone hookups that's the problem here mm. the problem is that i don't think there's software that will easily take four five however many microphones you can figure out how to plug into like my my preamp for my the, the podcast i do mm -hmm. has four inputs okay yeah i could put i could plug four different mics in here it would go into four different channels on the recording software and that it's absolutely fine. Oh, it will There's actually no go into problem. four different channels? Yeah, yeah, I can do it. I can at least oh. do two for sure, but yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure I could do four. Because <laughs> I was thinking most of the mic inputs that I've seen that are microphone preamps to then plug it into your computer with a USB cable, they're usually summing together the mics as well. Now let me look. <laughs> so, for example, mine has two microphone inputs and a, a left and right channel output, so it would be it would definitely be possible for sure to have two microphone signals going into right. a computer and people set, have been I mean, working I have to look at this thing for sure but it's got like the the, the there's, there's a little line underneath the first two that say uh microphone inputs and the other two that say in instrument in inputts but ah. i 
pretty sure that you can EQ each one of those separately with a included hmm. software. It's a pre-Sonus something something. But I mean, even if you could get all four, let's just pretend. Okay. All sure. four mics plugged in. There is no software that's f like Room EQ Wizard that where you can analyze all four of those simultaneously and see them all simultaneously and do all yeah. the stuff. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be. Yeah. Uh, they've that's been working you, on Room EQ uh, Wizard to get yeah. two. They've been working yeah. on that. Uh, it, it's not out yet, but that is something that's in the works is to allow two microphones to measure simultaneously. Where do you put the second mic? That's the real question. <laughs> you get oh. the first mic at your prime listening position, then where's the second mic? On the seat next to you. I mean, at least you can see uh, you have two seats are uniform. Yeah, that I one. guess. I mean, for me, it's, it's like I want, I want three. I want one on the one on either right. side. So, But, but to uh, that end, one of my thoughts was, well, quite a few of us have more than one tablet or phone at this point like maybe you sure. and your wife both have a phone and maybe you also have a tablet this is not out of the question at all these days yeah. so if you have three devices like that you could get the microphone so there's several different microphones that uh, are actual measurement microphones that can plug into your phone or tablet usually they just use the headphone microphone jack which is a problem if you're using phones these days that no longer have headphone jacks oh, which is annoying that. the heck out of me but uh you can use the little adapter that you know goes to headphone jack to usb c or a headphone jack to a lightning cable or whatever the heck you're doing there um but dayton has one example which is i think it's only like 17 dollars, so you could pick up three of those for a very reasonable price um and then there are other ones. Mini DSP does have one that's uh, fifty-five dollars, and uh, of course, our friends over at uh, Cross Spectrum Labs. There, um, he has one which is so it's one hundred and twenty-five dollars. But the difference is that this is the only one that actually goes below twenty hertz. Um, yeah. The other two mics, being as small as they are, they don't have any response below twenty hertz. The ones that Cross Spectrum Labs sells goes all the way down to five hertz with accuracy. <laughs> so that's that's what you're paying with for all the extra money is if you want to go below twenty. But for the purposes of just seeing if you can get uniform base across, let's say, three seats, uh, yes, you're, you yourself are going across to three different screens, but at least it's still in real time. Yeah. You know, three different devices. And that's, it's an affordable, I mean, it's, yes, it's a kind of a janky workaround, but it's affordable. So I, I could see maybe doing that. Yeah, but once you see that, when you, you can't adjust it on the fly. Well, you can adjust the subwoofers on the fly and see what oh, the, the results are. Oh, the face and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you could. Because that, yeah. that's what he wants to do is, is see the result of making a change to the subwoofer, either its position or a setting on the sub, and to see in real time then what it did, but across multiple seats. Are so, these, is, is this all one email? Because these questions are all over the place. Oh, no, those <laughs> were several, several different emails, but it was all okay, one okay, person, okay, good, so good, I grouped good, them good. into one man. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> okay, good, good, because I'm like, what? Uh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You could, at least for the, the phase stuff, you could do Oh, that. sure. Or even physically moving the sub around. Right. Yeah. So Oppo's own Ultra HD Blu-ray players are no longer available, save for their last batch plans for the summer. But what about 4K Blu-ray players from other brands that are based on the 203 or 205, like the Cambridge CX UHD? That player is still available for from several retailers, and while its seven hundred dollar price was initially higher than the five fifty Oppo, it's now uh, it's a two hundred three. It's now cheaper for what the two hundred three units are going for. Yes. So will Oppo live on behind the scenes, or will the rebadged players disappear soon too? Dude, I bet that they live on behind the scenes. They're probably like. Oh, you think I mean, so? I I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I would see. I could see it happening. Uh, I don't, I mean, it I depends think what happens with this trade war that apparently we're starting. I caught <laughs> with everybody. Five, five seconds of the news today, and I was like, okay, turn it off. Because <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds awful. I don't want to... Can we go back to listening to Jack Johnson, pretending mm. that the world's still... I, I don't know. I mean, Oppo is... So uh, the guys over at AV Forums in the UK, apparently they had a lot more information from Oppo than like anybody oh, else yeah? for some reason. Because they were like, oh yeah, the people they were talking to from Oppo... Uh, which is the parent company is based in China. And sure. they're like, we have our manufacturing plants. We're making much more money on cell phones and cell phone related products. They so, do make cell phones, but we don't get those in the States. No, but they do in other parts of the world. Yeah. So they're like, that's where we're making our profit. So we're going to reclaim all of the manufacturing space that was being done on these consumer electronics products yeah. and use that for cell phone space. So I'm like, where are the parts going to be manufactured? for right. the these other behind the, you know these other players that were rebadged i i, I think interesting. i think they're just uh, going away that you know and, and that would be a shame if it was if it yeah. was so and uh, one of my thoughts is that selling to manufacturers is a lot easier than selling to consumers 
Sure. And that they they might want to stay on, you know. Or, I mean, maybe just sell the design if someone else is willing to set up the fabrication plant to put the darn thing together. We'll see. We'll see. But, yes, uh, if that's true, then, yeah, they sound like they're going away. When we talk about base pressurization, is there something that you uh, something you could still experience even with the master volume set to reference uh, below reference volume? Obviously, at full reference volume, it ought to be noticeable. But how Mm -hmm. low can you turn the volume dial before the room, uh, the full room pressurization effect goes away? Well, I know. I mean, in my room, <laughs> I wasn't anywhere near full reference volume, and I was like, I I was like jumping to the remote to turn it down because it, okay. it was shaking the whole room. So <laughs> I I guess it depends on the source and the it disc. Does. Yeah. So I mean, if if you're if you're one of those discs that's mixed pretty low, you know, you could go above reference volume, and it would still maybe not hit pressurization. But I'm telling you, Jurassic Park at like negative ten was. I, I was like, my wife is going to come in here and scream at me if I don't turn it down. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, as far as getting a tactile sensation and then the pressurization uh, sensation of, you know, actually feeling like your chest being compressed or getting that blurriness in your vision. Uh, interestingly, that can happen at a lower decibel level than what our hearing will <laughs> will tell us. Right, is right, a, right. Like at a very low frequency, like 20 hertz or especially below 20 hertz, where it has to be playing at like 80 or 85 decibels for our ear to register it at 20 hertz. Uh, But you can still sense it. This is why sometimes they talk about, oh, this is bass you can feel but not hear, right? Mm. And that that can occur at a decibel level lower than 80 or 85 decibels. So naturally, if there's a sound in the soundtrack that at full reference volume would have been the maximum that it could be in the low frequency effects channel of 115 decibels, you could be significantly below full reference volume and right. still feel pressurization. You'd be 30 decibels below and still be at 85 right, right. for that. But for most of the other bass in the movie, it would probably be too quiet. Right. So, yeah, it, it depends on the source. There's there's no hard and fast number I can say. Set your volume dial to this and you will always feel pressurization. It, it depends. It, it's variable. McMansion Chris. This is only the second question. Yeah. It's the second person. <laughs> we are an hour into this podcast. And this is not all my fault. McMansion and Chris has a Marantz SR7010 receiver and an Epson 5040 UV projector. He's been using his Oppo BDP-103 Blu-ray player until now. But now that Redbox is starting to carry 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays, he wants to get an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. He cares more about the audio than the video. He doesn't care about the player having any built-in streaming services, thank God. With Oppo <laughs> no longer an option and a desire to spend less than $300 if possible, what do we recommend most highly? Well, I've got the Sony BDP, whatever it is, X700. Yes. And that one is uh, fine. And yes. the streaming services bother me because the <laughs> lip sync is not nearly as good as it is on other one. Uh, the discs look fine, but the streaming okay, services yeah. drive me and they're just a little bit behind. And if I fix that, it screws up everything else. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you don't care about streaming services, the Sonys are good. Uh, sure. As far I, as I, pitch, I... picture is concerned, though, I have noticed that the you know watching a 4K disc, the... Uh, the colors aren't 100% correct, or at least the darks. Hmm. A lot of times you can see there's, it, it almost looks like there's like a, a, in the dark sections that you'll see, uh, like something looks like it, it, it it's glowing almost a little hmm. bit. It's, it's a little bit lighter around it. You like, are having to convert, in your case, you're having to convert the HDR signal that's on the disc to SDR though. And it tells you that if you hit the info yeah. button, it says HDR to SDR. Mm-hmm. So that conversion mm-hmm. is not like, super awesome <laughs> right and I mean? that's that's the reason i would i would recommend going with the x800 yeah. um which is so you can get it on amazon right now for they've got a 228 dollars so definitely under 300 uh the x800 has some settings in it not as many as the oppo offers but it has some settings in it to let you adjust that hdr to sdr conversion if you want to do that uh although the 5040 UB can accept an HDR10 signal. It doesn't have to convert to SDR. Yeah, you gotta so, probably do that. You know, yeah, you, you could just send that out. But I like recommending the X800 to anybody using a projector because very often you, you do didn't even... recommend that to me when I asked you. Yes, you I recommended did. the 700. You said to get the 700. You Why said you, you wanted the cheapest one, so I said get the X700. That was the cheapest one. That's not what I said. That I is said what you said. You said, what's the cheapest? Uh, doesn't sound like me. It doesn't sound like me at all. Well, plus I, I was... said 
cheapest and best. Plus, I was using it as a guinea pig. I wanted to see if the 700 had the same settings as the 800, but we went through the, all the menu options and it doesn't look like it does. It doesn't. So. No, there are no setting options for the HDR. The <laughs> well, SDR. there's the, are you using a flat panel or a projector? But that's about it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. that's it. it the X800 has screens. more. It actually has some variables about how how dark or bright the image as a whole gets when you convert HDR to SDR. The X800 has that. Christian, at Bethesda's E3 conference, they showed some super wide gameplay footage. Uh, okay. What kind of display do conferences like that use to make videos like that possible? How much does that sort of thing cost? Super widescreen what? Yeah, so I mean, they, they had this display up behind whoever was talking on screen or on, no. on stage. And it was this no. really wide display. And really what it looks like is three 16 by 9 images side by side by side. That's, so they have three projectors back there. They, they got three projectors back there. That's what, well, especially since they did things like what I'm showing in the image on YouTube, which is they would show the person talking on either side and then the graphic in the middle. Right. So it very clearly looks like three projectors that were blended together side by side. But that takes some doing too, getting that blending, because they did yeah. show gameplay footage, which used like that entire width of the screen to make a super wide image. And you didn't see the seams in between, and it looked like it was blended pretty well. So there's some stuff going going on so how'd they well, do that I mean, what does it cost you can uh there's lots of graphic cards that are out there that i've yeah. even had on not very expensive computers that will allow you to put multiple screens right next to each other sure and then spread spread everything out uh i don't remember them going three wide i mean, it's usually most of them like do it, two yeah yeah they'll do two yeah and then or maybe four <laughs> so yeah. that you just basically blow it up but uh you know that that's not an unusual thing to see in a in a computer no, and getting the blending, so so having it just butted end to end, that's right. fairly simple. Most most yeah. regular graphics cards do that. But uh, so there's a company called Matrox. So I, I'm I'm sure this isn't what Bethesda was using because it looked like they were actually doing like three 4K projectors side right. by side. So they're probably using something much higher end. But sure. for a normal person or a normal company that isn't you know their size and doing a show at E3. Uh, you can get um, cards from a company called Matrox, they go for about 500 bucks, that do three screens, and they do more than just butt the images together side by side. They actually blend the images mm. uh, into one another. So they gradually, so let's say the screen that's farthest on the left, they will gradually dim the right side of that screen, and then they will gradually dim the left side of the middle uh, projector, and when you put them together, they sort of blend together. That's right. the idea. So that's some processing going on. But the graphics cards themselves that can do that are only about five hundred dollars, five to seven hundred dollars, depending on what you know sort of power you're looking for. So that's not too bad. And then usually you'd be using a you know a large venue projector for this type of thing. Again, I'm thinking Bethesda was using three 4K projectors, so they're probably much more expensive than the right. standard Mitsubishi or Panasonic. So the Matrox cards, they're like, we work best with these, like the D6000 from Panasonic, which is about a $10,000 projector, or the 8000 series from Mitsubishi, <laughs> which is about a $20,000 projector. Yeah. It's just $60,000. Um, but uh, but the, the, D8, that, the D6000 from Panasonic is less than 1080p resolution, I think yeah. it's like that 768 resolution right, right, thing. Right, right. And then the Mitsubishis are 1080p resolution for $20,000 a piece. But they also have like, what is it, 20, uh, not uh, like 17,000 lumens or something like that. <laughs> but you kind of need that when you got yeah. the whole lights on and everything going yeah, on. Yeah. So, yeah, you're looking at, uh, I don't know what, 30 to, <laughs> 30 to $60,000 for a normal. And then these guys probably spent a lot more than that. Yeah. They also just probably rented it. Yes. David on Twitter. David mentioned previously how he was getting lots of blockiness and noise whenever dark images are being shown on his EG9-9100 OLED. Mm -hmm. uh, he sent a, a picture showing the completely unwatchable example. The show was Legion on FX being streamed via, via his NVIDIA Shield with a wired connection. All right, so if you're seeing this, yes. uh, you know what we're talking about. If you're not seeing this, imagine if you took all the colors of blue Legos that you could find and threw them in a box <laughs> yeah. and look down at it. Because that's what this looks like. It's just square images of them. Now, I can't imagine the entire show was like this, but this was like during a scene that was supposed to be sort of uniformish color or like a color that Something. changed I'm not quite slightly. sure. I, it it, it is like completely it unwatchable. That top. is indiscernible as anything. No, well, I mean... It's just, it's just I, blocks. I, 
I clearly see a butterfly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> Those are very I don't know. I see almost kind of a smiley face with those. those there couple... is a bit of a of a, 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 a space invader in the middle, a little that's bit right. to the right, right? <laughs> and on the left there, that's the space invader that just got shot and he's blowing up. Yeah. And then the dark spot in the top right, that would be the shot, that other shot that missed. And then above there, there's a little white part. <laughs> Uh, which is the UFO going by at the top. And okay. since, since Legion is such a weird show, who knows, maybe that is what it was. But no, that, that is an unwatchable image, yes. I have not watched the second season of Legion, but I'm very excited to get into it. I just finished the second season of Attack on Titan, so ah. I'm now opening up my <laughs> watching, viewing things, other things. My wife has started watching Merlin, Oh yeah, which is a show on the BBC, which, I, which makes me want to slowly kill myself because mm. that show is bad. All right. On Rob's advice, he tried playing Pacific Rim on a physical Blu-ray disc, and he saw no evidence of this egregious problem in the dark images. So he tried using his Roku instead of his shield to stream Legion again, and the Roku had the same awful picture. Mm. Sometimes it isn't even the dark images that the whole show can look blurry or pixelated sometimes. So what is going on here? What is to blame? Because the current situation is unacceptable. You, sir, have a bit weight. Right, it's you. It there, it's what certainly you have. seems that way. <laughs> you, yeah. sir, are not getting whatever bandwidth you think you're getting from your uh, your ISP. Okay, your net service provider has told you, unless you are on dial-up, which is almost kind of what this looks yeah. like. Uh, and I have seen stuff like this happen on my computer. Oh, yeah. On my, on my stream. It happens. You're, yeah. You get a bit rate dip for one reason or another, and everything goes blah, and my wife looks over at me and says, what's going on? Is it broken? I'm like, just wait. It'll be fine. And then it slowly buffers and catches up, and then it goes back to HD. You're stuck at SD level. Lower than SD, yeah. I mean, oh, the, yeah. This is like this is this is bad. Yeah, so. I mean, this is when it's 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 compressing it so badly that you're getting this horrible macro blocking because that's what yeah, we're seeing here. That's is horrible macro, macro yeah. blocking. Yeah. And then when you're describing that, sometimes the entire thing looks blurry or pixelated. I mean, that's just it's dropped the resolution probably down to like 240p. You know, like YouTube can do that, right? Yep. Can can go that low. It so, can. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so does, I, 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 I really wanted him to play the Blu-ray disc because I'm like, if a Blu-ray looks like this, something's wrong with your we TV. We got a problem, yes, that's this TV issue. But he's like, no, nah, the blue, the blue, I mean, there were some imperfections because, yes, there are in, in the older OLEDs, in the very dark scenes, there were some imperfections, which is something we mentioned before. But yeah. he's like, nothing like this. You know, this is egregious and unwatchable. It, like, it looked pretty darn clean from the Blu-ray. So I'm like, okay, we know it's not your TV. We know the Shield and the Roku are entirely capable of streaming right. very good-looking images, maybe not quite as good as an Ultra HD Blu-ray, but very, very good looking images. So it's not the hardware. That's the good news. The bad news is this is a bit starved situation, but we don't, we can't say exactly why. We don't know what service you're paying for and what level of service. Um, are right. He says it? he's on the wired connection, which is good. But if yeah. your wired connection is to a modem that is, or a yeah. uh, router that is not, uh, is not getting uh, enough bandwidth or yeah. If there's something else going on, if you're, I mean, if you've Sometimes got three kids in the those... house and all of them are playing Fortnite at the same time. Yeah. You know, I mean... Sometimes people are using those power line adapters, right? Yep. And they're like, that, that's a hardwired connection, but those power line adapters can have lots of interference that drops your bit rate as a result. Yep. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a Wi-Fi problem if you had it, you know, hardwired in. Uh, but uh, like, I was wondering, like, are you maybe using a VPN? A lot of people use a VPN, yeah, VPNs will starve you too. A virtual private network so that your your internet service provider can't see everything that you're doing. It's a way to sort of mask your activity. A lot of people use that or they use it because they're in another country and they want to access the United States version of Netflix or something. Like I would right. have to use a VPN if I wanted to do that when I'm here in Canada. And very often going through a VPN will will drop your bit rate to next to nothing. So yeah. It's something in your bitrate. That, that is so, the cause, but we don't know exactly what. You want to go to your computer or whatever it is, connect to the same, like if you have a laptop, it'd be great. Sure. Connect to the same uh, wire that you're connecting your, yeah. uh, your, your NVIDIA Shield and all this other stuff to, and then just do a speed test. Just do a speed test. In fact, you and can do that right on the NVIDIA Shield because there's a speed test app. Oh, yeah, it is a computer. Yeah, yeah. sure, why not? Uh, and then see what's going on there. And then uh, if yeah. you were promised like 1.5, whatever it is per second, and it's telling you something significantly lower than that, it's time to call your internet service provider mm. and figure out what's going on. You could just have an old modem or a could bad router or something like that. Yep. So we won't know for sure until you do some tests. Infinite Gary has infinite. No, he doesn't. He no. has like, only a couple of questions or one <laughs> question, two questions. Gary says, can we please sort something out for Gary? We've often talked about absorption panels, typically two feet by four feet in size, because that's what size they come in. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much always say to mount them so that they're at ear height, mostly two feet off the floor. 
it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been mentioned that there's not much benefit to having panels that uh, in the bottom in that bottom two feet or worrying about making panels full floor to ceiling. But then we've also sometimes talked about just having panels in the room pretty much anywhere. So which is it? Now, first of all, I have never said the words. There's no point to having panels in the bottom two feet or about oh, worrying about I've making panels floor to ceiling. <laughs> uh, there's no point to having panels in the bottom two feet because you're going to cover your electrical outlets. <laughs> so that well, is... <laughs> you're not literally covering the whole wall. It doesn't That's have to. That's why I don't want to... A lot of times, like literally my panel that is my first reflection point for my left, my right speaker is right above an outlet <laughs> so that's just right. uh, just that uh you know when the when your room is highly reflective any absorption anywhere is better than no absorb than better than what you currently have right that's so just to get rid of the room ringing as a whole right you know even your own voice in some rooms and we've all experienced this you go into some sure. rooms and you're just talking and you can like literally hear a bit of an echo or at least a reverberation and in those situations if you can put some absorption anywhere, it'll help. It'll just cut down the reverberation of the room as a whole. Sure. But when people ask us, where should I put my panels? That's a different answer. Yeah, because you know, then that we're talking has to do with specifically the, about reflections the, from the speakers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a different answer. So what, what to clarify, pretty much, so yeah. which is it? Both. It is both. Right. It all depending depends on the, on the, the situation. Court. Yeah, the situation. If you're like, remember that guy in India who had the uh, marble, marble room? Yeah. I was like, dude, I don't care where you put the panel. Put it someplace. Get, Just get something in there. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Poor guy. As much as, yeah. you, can. As yeah. much as you can. Yeah. That's right. I mean, sometimes you have a room that is not reverberant. You know, you go in there and it sounds like a normal room and you can hold a conversation yep. without any sort of echo or rever reverberation. But you might still want to put some acoustic panels at your first reflection points or directly behind your own head. And that is to get rid of the strong reflections that are going from the speaker to a wall to your ear. And you're, you're right. cutting down on that specific reflection. And we want those at your ear height because it's that specific reflection. Uh, yeah, it's the overall too reverberant a room where we're like put it anywhere just to get rid of that echo in your room all right so gary says he's tried a few 4k hdr displays at this point including it. he has an oled doesn't he he sure does and he just isn't enjoying them even after professional calibration they just appear too vivid and to gary's eyes unnatural he feels as though he's looking at a best buy store display do we have the same reaction uh no i have never seen in my room a 4k display <laughs> But it feels to me like this is some sort of video processing that you might have on. Mm. I mean, nah, he's Adam Pro calibrated. Oh well, um, I mean, that doesn't mean that they haven't turned it off. They did the thing that they're supposed to do. Mm. Yeah. yeah, even even if you just set your old LED to like ISF night mode, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, uh, even if you, yeah did nothing else. Maybe um, you just don't like him, dude. Maybe you're not ready for him. Yeah, it's it doesn't it's seem okay. doesn't seem to be to his preference, which is fine. Nobody's obligated yeah. to prefer it. Uh, I don't feel the same way. I do feel that the OLED that I have and that my parents has definitely looks more vivid, that the colors are stronger and more vibrant than my old TV, That's than their old TV. the point, though, isn't it? Isn't the that the contrast, point? The contrast definitely looks higher. There's no question because the blacks are just inky black and the white levels are significantly brighter if you want them to be like when i tried watching my oled in a truly pitch black room which i i don't usually do that's not my viewing environment but i tried just completely pitch black room and i had to turn that oled light setting that's the overall light put out of the whole panel i had to turn that down to 12 <laughs> because i was like it's too bright otherwise in a in a really pitch black room i'm like too bright it makes me squint um so there's some of that going on it, it is brighter unquestionably um so i don't think you're wrong because there is a difference there's a clearly visible difference i agree it, it looks more vibrant and more contrasty and i had to turn the light down if my lights were off uh but i like it <laughs> so i don't feel that i don't like it but that's just a difference of opinion about you're certainly not not seeing seeing a difference there is a difference to be seen Most well i would hope like so i mean if you're gonna go out and buy a brand new technology no. You know, I would hope that you would see a difference. <laughs> if not, then why are you buying the new technology? You know, at least that's my, you know, my take on that. Yeah. Find six. What? What are you doing? No, sorry. I'm trying to, I, I lost, uh, I lost the place that I was at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find it and it didn't find it. There's Infinite Gary. I found him. All right. Okay. Number six. <laughs> Like, I, like sometimes it's I try so to scroll to another screen. Document. It is. 
But I scroll to a different screen, and then when I come back, that whole thing has to load back up. Oh, and I, I didn't mean to. I was trying to go to a different desktop because I was going to check my email real quick while you were. La, la, la. All right. <laughs> 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 you know, I bet whoever that podcast was that you just made fun of that you didn't like their format, they are gonna like comment on this like you think your our format is bad. You should hear you guys ramble <laughs> on for two oh, two freaking hours. We're, it's we're terrible. A, we're a podcast. What I didn't like was they, they sounded too polished and professional. I'm like, that's not a podcast. Podcast is to <laughs> oh, be like two guys wait a second. I, who I'm have no idea what they're vaguely doing. insulted by that. I'm supposed to be we're not professional? I've been we're doing this for <laughs> ten years. We're not professional. <laughs> I feel like we're professional a little bit. All uh, right. Joe. Joe has two sons, and each son has his own Xbox One. They enjoy playing together in Joe's home theater, but one son gets the JVC X5500 uh, 550 projector, while the other son only gets a small computer monitor. Joe uses a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio screen, so is there a way to have the two images from the two Xbox Ones on that CinemaScope screen at the same time, side by side? Mm -hmm. Joe figures he'll need a video imager Tyler uh, with at least two HDMI inputs and one HDMI output. And to complicate things, he'd like everything everything to be 4k compatible both for the existing setup and for a future 4k projector upgrade he'd love to be able to switch between showing one of the xboxes as it would normally show up on the screen all on its own and the other two xboxes side by side without having to physically plug and unplug any cables and to top it all off it needs to be reliable and affordable what have we got <laughs> that's uh <laughs> Well, okay, I think I was all on board with this question until you got to affordable. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. At, at affordable, I think you lost the plot. But uh, <laughs> you were okay up to there because this is certainly 100% doable. You see this all the time on yes. uh, uh, demonstrations of video games on, um, on uh, you know, TV shows. Okay, sure, yeah. So there's no reason why this doesn't exist. I just don't know that you can do it affordably. And Rob's going to tell you whether or not that's the case. Oh, pl right plus now. without a whole bunch of lag. Because usually when you're seeing it on a TV show, they kind of put that together in post-production. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. pre-captured footage and then they're putting that together. That's so the lag isn't yeah. a problem. But in real time, you don't want the lag. Um, yeah, so if you go to somewhere like B&H Photo, they do okay. have uh, Tyler's and they do have uh, things that they just call multi-view processors. Uh, now, do you consider $500 affordable? Because there are $500 units that what they're designed to do is put up four images, you know, like one in each corner. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you could just put up two and then like your projector has lots of lens shift. So you could put up two images and then just move it down or up to make that fit your screen. Um, sure. But there's a problem, which is that if you get one of the ones that can do this with HDMI, for $500, it's limited to 1080p. There aren't sure. any that can do it 4K. There are ones that can do it at 4K. They're about $3,000, and they don't do HDR. There, it's 4K resolution, but it's 4K resolution at the 10.2 gigabits per second, which means uh, you're not getting the HDR, or you're only getting it at 30 frames a second, which for video games, not so great. You want the 60 yeah. frames a second. So you can do this at 1080p for about 500 bucks. That is... That can be done. Um, but he said he wants 4K. I tell you, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, dude. For uh, for $3,000, <laughs> it's just cheaper to buy a second projector. And well, there sure would be. And that, that is really my, one on the other really my suggestion. Have <laughs> well, especially because you've yeah. already got the X550. Lots of, it's motorized lens memories. Yeah. So you can just yeah. have it so that you press a button and it shrinks down and moves over to one side. Yeah, and then you fire up a second projector. Now you can get, uh, like, if you were going to do the 1080p solution for 500 bucks, you can get a 1080p projector for 500 bucks, which is going to look better than the tiny little computer monitor that one son is using right now. It won't right. look as good as the JVC beside it, but oh well, it's still an upgrade over the computer monitor. Or if you wanted to even do it at 4K, I mean, you could get one of the $1,500. 4K DLP projectors as cheaper than three thousand dollars for right. the Tyler that can do this at 4K resolution. Uh, now there is a company called Black Magic Design. They have a multi-view unit that can do 4K. Again, it's only 10.2 gigabits per second. But it so can... are both the kids wearing headphones? Then I guess to do yeah, this because yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're doing head. Well, on the Xboxes, you can actually just have the the sound coming out of the controller. 
directly that's into true, headphones. That's true. That's true. Yeah, um, you would you would have to because if not, then it's going to get real confusing real fast. Yeah, but the the Black Magic Design one that I wanted to mention, it can do the 4K limited to 10.2 gigabits per second, um, but it can do the 4K at about five hundred dollars. But it's an SDI connection because it's a professional video monitoring sure. thing, which means you'd have to convert the HDMI to SDI, and to do that at 4K resolution is about one hundred and forty dollars, and you'd need two of them. So now you're spending like eight hundred dollars to do this. At which point you can get just get another projector. Um, <laughs> so I would, the answer yeah, is a new projector. I really think the solution is to get a second projector. I, I really, really, genuinely think that's what you what you should do. Here. Or you tell your sons to suck it, and they can the the one you don't like the most can use the little computer monitor, and they can switch off every once in a while. Because that's kind that. of what I would do. Yeah, but that's yeah, I, I mean, I think he wants an easy, simple. Uh, affordable solution in a box you can just plug this stuff into and have it work yeah, 500 bucks you can do it at 1080p but yeah right. Right. so Schmidt I believe so Schmidt Schmidt, Schmidt. Yeah. Schmidt wrote this a little over three years ago and I did recognize that name and he says our advice back then was very helpful well, you're welcome sir or madam Sir, he's been renting an apartment for the last uh, past several years, but now he's just bought a house. He plans to set up his home theater in the basement, but he's trying to figure out which section of his basement should be the home theater area and how to best position everything. The stairs come down sort of in the middle of the space, and there's no door. If you just come down the stairs, there's a room to the left that's roughly 10 feet wide and about 15 feet long. But that room is not all the same width. There's just a jut in for the storage area just under the staircase. Okay, so if you come down the stairs and you turn left and you turn left again, you so you make correct turn you know 180 degrees. You're looking down the 15 foot wall, and then there's a little space underneath the uh, but the staircase there too as well. That's right. To the right of the stairs, there's a larger room, about 14 feet wide and 20 feet long, but it's not a rectangle either. There's a small hallway that leads to a utility room and then a bathroom. So which side of the basement would you recommend using as a theater, and what is the best way to position the setup? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you could still build a wall. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> it option doesn't on either really side. really look like that's the plan. Well, but... I mean, it's not the plan. That's for sure. And he's got like a video walkthrough, which is, I actually thought was, it, it was helpful, but also a little bit confusing. So, um, we have dealt with this sort of situation before uh, in rooms and, you know, he he's taking the pictures in, in backwards order, which the ones that you're seeing on the screen. So if you're looking at the one, if you're showing Rob, the one that has okay. the, the exercise machine, that's okay. the, the first one. That that's is the, the smaller room that's about 10 room. feet wide, 15 feet long or so. Right, yeah. 15 feet long. So that one right there, now I don't know what that opening back there I, is that is to. What is that window that's in the back there? That's yeah, I'm not quite something. sure. I mean, I would think that goes to maybe your electrical panel. I don't know. That that's the but type that, of opening I would expect for that, but yeah, I'm not quite that sure. sort of scares me a little bit. So there's there's a couple of different options here that I'm looking at. Now the other picture, Rob, if you can mm -hmm. show that one, is actually like to your left is the staircase. Correct. Yeah, and he's he's taking you, it from it, the back of the room where the bathroom is, where right. the hallway so is in the bathroom. Yeah. There's a hallway in the bathroom back there, and you can see he's got it set up so that the, his couch is on the staircase, and then there's a uh there's a TV on the other wall. Yeah. Now, I, I, either of these rooms is going to be uh, challenging, but not impossible. Sure. So I kind of, just looking at them, I kind of like the first room. Okay, if we go, if really? we go back to that one. The narrow and the reason room. I, okay. Yeah, the reason I like it is because there's that space underneath the staircase there. Yes. And I like the idea of putting the screen... Uh, either on the false wall right there and everything behind it. I mean, it only that gives you probably, well, it's 10 feet. It's still 10 feet from the beginning of that, from, you know, it would be 10 feet from the screen to the back of the room. Uh, unless you can do it the opposite way so that you're covering up whatever that little door is at the back so that you're going right. across the 10 foot width. You could put a false wall there, put your stuff behind there. Or just a, like. a, a retractable screen would also retractable work. Retractable screen would work as well. Sure. Uh, where you've got it currently set up, I think is also okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that as well. Uh, I don't. You just clearly can't cover up the door to the or the hallway to the bathroom. So, nope. I, I think those there's three options here. There's how okay. you've got it. Uh, 
the, the first one I said, which was, you know, the screen under or the screen of the TV or whatever underneath the staircase or the screen at the back of the room where your little piano. When you're saying the screen is. under the staircase, are you talking like you it would be on uh, what, like one of the 15 foot walls and yeah. then you'd be across the room from that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But then you're only 10 feet away at the most. Only and that's 10 feet that's away. with your seat on the back wall. That's with your seat on the back wall. That is true. Mm. Ah, gosh. I, I, I honestly, I mean, I was looking at this. And I, how would I set this? I, I mean, my instinct is to go for the larger room. Just that's that's my first instinct. Yeah, but you got less options back there. This other one has got like you can do stuff to it. But I would just think like when this when it's only ten feet wide, because I mean, my my instinct is if it's only ten feet wide, I don't I don't really want to have my seat right up against the back wall if I can avoid it, which would mean sure. I would end up putting the screen on that wall that has the little door opening that goes to whatever. We're not quite sure what's sure. behind the little door. Um, so I would probably put my screen there. I'd probably go for a retractable screen. But then it's only ten feet wide, so I mean, I guess you can still fit a three seater couch. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's I mean, not my too couch bad. is my couch is only my couch is ten feet, and I got like five people can sit on the day. All right, so, so there you yeah. go. I'll I'll agree to that. I'll say put I'll I'll say put a retractable screen on the wall that has the little door. Uh and then if a three-seater couch is enough, then you can have that. It, it, behind you will just be open to the the back and then to your left Seems will be the like staircase. Seems like that's what he's got right right there anyway, so the yeah. three-seater couch, right? Yeah, looks like. Okay. But you're not going to be able to get that side seat on there, that your little rec- whatever that recliner thing you yeah. use. Yeah. S- well, I know it could, you could sit like in the in the back corner and just be a sitting chair. It, it would still have a view of the screen, but it'd be, yeah. be far away. Yeah. There you go. Either way. That's what we'll recommend. The basement is carpeted and there's a drop tile ceiling, but otherwise the walls are a flat drywall and there's some fairly large windows. What we'd recommend in terms of acoustic treatments and where would we place them? Well, until we know where you've put your stuff. Okay. But let's it's assume, since, since both of us kind of favored going with the smaller room, even though it's not, yeah. not my first Disney, but it, ultimately it makes the most sense is to go with the smaller side. Um, let's just assume that's where he is. Where would panels go? Because it's not too complicated, right? Side walls, whatever your side, side walls, walls end up being. Yeah, <laughs> wherever your first reflection point is. And then behind you, I think there are windows back there. Oh, yes. So yeah. I don't think you can put anything back there. Yeah, you can there. kind of see from the, other, from the other photo, you can see that there is windows I over to the left. I thought that was a door. Well, it's more something. like a door leading outside, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a very strange basement. <laughs> well, not really. I mean, the stairs come I, down, and there's a room to the left and a room to the I, right. I, I <laughs> guess I'm uh, I'm used to basements being like not. I mean, I, as someone who's never owned a basement, I have literally no experience. But but pressurizing this room room with base, that's not going to happen. You don't have a no. door to your basement. You've got this whole open space. We're not talking about construct. I mean, if you want to construct a wall, this that changes everything. But he didn't mention anything about that. He's like, this is the space I got. What's the best way to set it up? Assuming it is the way that yeah, it is. Yeah, if you put a so. if, if if like when you if you put a a back wall on your ten foot wide room, mm. right from where the staircase is, I all guess. the way across. But then then you're there. shortening that room quite a bit too. So. You are, but I mean, yeah. we don't know how much by how much. It doesn't look like it's going to be that much, but it's probably going to turn into <laughs> like a ten by ten room. Ten but by twelve gonna, at the most, or something. Yeah, yeah, ten by twelve. Well, yeah, I guess maybe twelve, thirteen, something like that. Looks like it's got a little refrigerator back there anyways. But so uh, those are deeper than two. But feet. we don't know what the ventilation system would be at that point and all that. Like, it's a well, whole it's got a drop worms. tile. So, I mean, clearly he can just add a yeah. vent someplace if he has to. In any case, uh, let's assume the the construction is remaining as is. We'd put some well, panels I would just, on the side first, walls. First, first reflection side points. walls are the first reflection point. There's nothing you can do from behind your head unless you put some nah. freestanding panels And you there. wouldn't really need it anyway. There's, there's sufficient and, I mean, room behind you. I'm not too worried about that. If these aren't acoustic tile panels, uh, uh, the acoustic tile for the drop tile, and mm. some good ones of those, you could replace all of those with you could. decent ones. Uh, and that would be nice. Actually, well. yeah, I, that, that'd be quite a bit of absorption if you went for the absorbing type of acoustic tiles. Since he's got a bunch of around fifteen hundred dollars for some new gear, he needs a new display, a pair of surround speakers, although that isn't a priority, uh, and that budget would also need to cover the, the acoustic panels, any accessories or cables or an, equi- or, or an equipment stand. His old TV stopped working, so it's just sitting there apparently. <laughs> so, uh, what would he go for in terms of a display? He's thinking a projection setup would be nice. So, which screen and projector? If he uh, if he goes that route. So if you're sitting on that back wall with a retractable screen, you're probably, I mean, really, I would recommend sitting, getting a bigger, a, a slightly smaller screen and sitting closer to it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Reason... I mean, I wouldn't go beyond 92. 
Like if, you, if yeah. you're going in that smaller room that's only 10 feet wide, I, I would but go with a 92 that, inch screen. Yeah, I think I would go smaller than that because 92 is not going to give you a ton of room to the sides to place speakers. Yeah, but it's enough. And it, it's tough to find smaller than 92. <laughs> uh, you can get, you can get 80. Can't you get 80 or 82? Isn't that, isn't that a standard size, 86? Not from like most places, no. Hmm. But I, I am suggesting hmm. retractable, so it's probably going to be to keep the budget under control what probably elite right yeah you gotta Most go likely elite. yeah because silver ticket isn't really selling retractable screens anymore unfortunately no, they're not so uh and that's gonna set you back what like 500 bucks 400 bucks for a retractable well what about screen? mono price maybe we go mono price for a retractable screen i'm just, i'm a little leery price? of elite these days because people are having all those problems they are having issues i, I don't want to google it right now yeah, but I'm thinking Monoprice does have affordable... I mean, they're just basic white, but they're affordable retractable screens. You're going to want to cover up those windows, though, man. If you're going projection, you got it. You got to get something. Yeah, but, I mean, that's just blackout curtains. That's doable. Yeah, blackout curtains back there and, and on all of them, not just yes. the ones that are directly oh, behind you. You want to make this room as dark as you can. Cause yeah, at this price point, you're not getting an ambient light rejecting screen, and we don't really like them anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's going to get that's gonna raise a bunch of problems, to having said that. I apologize, right. all you ambient light rejecting loving screen people but um i don't apologize all right at so, this price it's uh, just going to be a white screen blackout curtains you could probably let's let's budget you need th two or three of them yeah. no they they usually cut they're, they're usually half a window wide mine are to make, mm. make them look nice so you're going to need probably let's just say you know two four three pairs which they usually come okay. in pairs anyways and i think when i bought mine which was a while ago uh they're fairly cheap i got them for on sale so let, they're 20 bucks each. oh okay so I think that's what I paid for mine. Uh, so let's budget 100 bucks for curtains. Sure. So now he's got $1,400 left. Let's budget $400 for a screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying okay, to see. Uh, I mean, you could, you, you could go manual. Manual. I was going to say, unless he, goes, goes, unless he wants to go manual, and that's going to be like, let, I think $200 is plenty for something like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, Monoprice has a 92-inch manual projection screen for 100 bucks. Okay. But but let's budget 200 bucks. I think that's reasonable. All right, so now we're at three hundred dollars. Okay, so three hundred okay. bucks. Uh, we need a projector. Yeah. Well, get the BenQ, right? I mean, you got yeah. to the 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 twenty fifty. Okay, and how much is that? About seven hundred bucks. So now we're up to a thousand dollars. About a thousand bucks. He needs either a shelf or a mount. So. Oh, but a mount for for what the projector? For the projector, yeah. Oh yeah, you can get those for like forty bucks. Okay, so now let's say fifty. So now we're sure. up to ten fifty total. Okay. Uh, he's gonna need a cable to get back to it, an HDMI cable to get back to it. Yep. So mono price again. And then mono price again for. I mean, we're gonna be sending you a mono because you can get the mount, the screen, and the HDMI cable all from mono price. So let's say another fifty bucks for the cable. Sure. That That's reasonable? probably more than enough, but yeah. Okay, so now we're at eleven hundred dollars. So we have four hundred dollars left to spend, and what else do you want? Uh, some surround speakers, and actually, we can deal with that because he, he talks about what he already has. So, all right, okay, all right. So that's this projector in the screen. But I think we can. It, I think we can do this quite reasonably. The acoustic panels, mm, if he acoustic panels. DIYs it, yeah, uh, or gets the kits from Acoustamac because you don't need yeah. a ton. I, I say, what, get four, get four. Well, I don't think he's going to have enough room for four in there. To be honest with you, mm. I would. Uh, I would. Actually, I don't even think he really needs a. I was thinking of corner traps, but I don't even think he needs that because he's gonna that entire no, so, other mean, room is just a base trap. It's just gonna get it's your gonna front left and right speakers are. I mean, even if you go with a smaller than ninety two, they are gonna be quite close the to corner. the side walls. So you're gonna want to yeah. have some panels like right on the side walls, right next to the speakers, like right. just just in front of them, right next to them. So let's just say that. two panels for now. Okay, we well, can do that for like a hundred bucks. Okay, so that now we're at. Uh, he's got three hundred dollars left to spend. Yeah, you can get surround speakers for three hundred bucks. For sure. Yeah. Uh, is that everything though? Uh, cables, you need display, a pair of sound speaker, a budget allows and cover acoustic panels and accessories like cables or equipment stand. You don't need the equipment stand. I think, I, I, yeah. I mean, okay. if you go with the mono price screen, I think you, you even have some wiggle room in there. Probably an extra hundred bucks going on. So. All right. He has a Yamaha RX V775 seven channel receiver, which is not Atmos capable and does not have HTCP 2.2. But he intends to stick with regular Blu-rays and Netflix for now. So that's okay. He's got a pair of Ascend Acoustics Sierra 2 speakers with a SVS PC2000 sub. If his budget allows, he'd like to add a pair of surround speakers to make a 4.1 system. Which speakers would we recommend? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's no reason not to stick with Ascent in this case. Oh, sure. The H With those HTM ones? Yeah, the HTM 200 SEs. They would yeah. they would definitely fit the bill here. 
and they'd be perfectly it'd be something that you could buy more of later on if you wanted to definitely yeah if you ever went to atmos or whatever they would they would absolutely make great uh ones there um you could go with focal little birds those yeah, actually that's the other, match yeah. sound wise with the with the uh, ascend speakers very nicely in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what, whatever works. How but I go HTMs? with one of those. Two. How much of those? They are what? the HTMs are two uh, three hundred dollars a pair. Oh, then you're done. That's right. It that's all it. fits. Look at that. Yeah. Aren't you happy? You asked. <laughs> Jim. How much time we have left? Jim has backed up his DVD collection and uses Plex for playback. Before pressing play, you can look at a preview screen that shows the poster art and a synopsis for and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. That preview screen also includes some audio video details about the file you're about to play. He knows that for some of his DVD backups, the resolution file is listed as 480i, while for others it's 480p. Why is that the case? Every single one of his Blu-ray backups is listed as 1080p. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, are some Blu-rays in 480i? Yes, some are. I'm not Blu-rays, but DVDs are in DVDs, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so some are, yeah. So. It depends on when you <laughs> buy them, I suppose. There you go. Yeah, well, per- particularly, so most of the ones that said enhanced for widescreen, which is the vast majority of DVDs, uh, those were usually all for AP. Um, but the, the actual format stored on a DVD was interlaced. That's why progressive scan DVD players were a thing. Right, right, right. Because they were stored in a way where you could put it back together into a progressive scan image flawlessly if you had the processing to do it. Right. But it came out when standard definition was the thing, and all standard definition televisions used interlacing. Well, that, interlacing that's just yes, what yeah. they did. Well, it, it, this is funny because it kind of ties back into what we were saying before about Atmos. You know, when a mm-hmm. new technology comes out, it's not always implemented exactly the way that you think it should be. The minute, I mean why not have your discs in progressive you know and well remember enhanced definition remember that yeah. <laughs> that's that that's what 480p was was enhanced definitions so there were enhanced definition TVs that were progressive scan and then we got progressive scan DVD players but so it's probably some of your earliest DVDs yeah. um yeah. those are probably the ones that are 480i also any of the DVDs that were in a 4x3 format which is like television shows you're like what would be in 4x3 but remember we had TV shows on DVD and TV was 4x3 back then right those were all 480i so yeah all right Patrick Patrick discovered AV Rent when the Home Theater Geeks got canceled. I'm sorry about the Home Theater Geeks getting canceled. I'm not sorry that you're here. (laughs) And now he's listened to every episode uh, available. I am extremely sorry that you have to do that. (laughs) We did not force this upon Patrick. Hours and hours of us droning on. This was his own volition. We, We did not... Do anything he did email me directly, this, so. and, and he said to confirm he got it back as far as episode 223. We're on yeah. like f- almost 600 now. Yeah. And uh, then all the episodes earlier than that are unavailable, so we must have originally been hosting the files on our website itself rather than Libsyn up through episode 222. Is that correct? Is there a way for him to get those first 222 episodes? No. I, I know. I mean, there is. You have to come to my house and you have to make a copy <laughs> of the of the DVDs. I just burned off of my computer. I did this uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, two and a half years of AV Rant podcast off of my computer. I have a terabyte drive on this thing. I yeah. got real super lazy. And I have not been <laughs> backing things up. So I had just, just backed up two and a half years of AV Rant podcast and put them on DVDs. I have... An entire, I could actually show you guys an entire, like, case of DVDs that's nothing but AV Rants. Is it conceivable you could burn DVDs for him and ship them to him? Maybe it's conceivable. For, for a price? I, I probably, I, 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 I mean, it's conceivable. I just don't know. Uh, or heck, what? put them on a USB stick and ship that to him. Really, that would be a lot easier. <laughs> I'd have to put the easier. discs in and then drop them. Because basically... <laughs> The discs have, uh, the early ones have a WAV file and the uh, MP3. Okay. The newer ones have a FLAC file and the MP3. Yeah. So I have both versions of it, so I don't have to. So well, I'd have the, to go through and manually grab all the MP3s and then dump them on uh, there. I, I guess if I got like one of those big old things and I spent way too much of my free time doing it. It's theoretically. But as far as an easily online accessible version, no. 
I'm surprised that, that we're only back to 222. I, I'm going to actually check this. Libsyn. All right. So I'm because <laughs> I thought that we were, I had, I don't think we had 200 episodes of this podcast on, uh, I didn't think we made it through a hundred before. You know Kurt what? If he's if there. if he's gone back, dug back through our website, which is not the easiest thing to navigate. Although I guess you can just search for episode titles. Uh, but if he's dug back and he got back as far as two two two, and then they all went away, I I, I am inclined to believe him. <laughs> I, I haven't done too. that. I don't know. I wasn't on this podcast back then. <laughs> that's that's good news for him. Five hundred and seventeen. I want to go to page fifty two. Fifty two. No. <laughs> 52 page 52 i'm doing this this is live this is riveting riveting podcasting yep is what's happening right now go i went oh i did oh no 52 is got um, you're actually gonna do this well, i guess I'm you're into it. it now i'm doing it now okay can't, uh, these are all stop now can't stop now these are all my should i just start first. greg's question because you're gonna be a while i'm not gonna be a while i, I just gotta get past the our first marriage ones because i used to have another podcast <laughs> with my wife called our first marriage which is on libsyn uh-huh. but not anyplace else what is that it says how <laughs> i don't know what that one is that one's weird i don't even remember what was happening back at 222 was it was that still dina or was liz on by then it would have been dina what is, mean, was it still dina i would think so I'm not sure. So. That's that's. I mean, that's probably more than five years in because. Well, you were pretty good about doing every single week. I, I we we did twice a week for a. There bit. was that, wasn't there? There was that. There time. was, yeah. Those podcasts are a lot shorter. It'll it'll be much faster to go through the first 222. Than, oh yeah, that than the last 222. <laughs> the last. Oh wait, there we go. Wait, wait, stop! I got that. Finally. Yeah, there we go. Hold yeah. On a I'm gonna yeah. go there. No, you don't. You lied. This is oh. horrible. This is the worst segment we've ever done. All right, here we go. The the uh, <laughs> uh, 2011. Okay, uh-huh. so 2011. Okay. 5 12 2011. Yes. That's the that's the first podcast that's on there. What number is it? I don't know. <laughs> well, that was the whole point. <laughs> Hold on a second. I got it. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Who cares what the date was? Well, that's why we I just... wanted to know which one it was. I'm going to press play. We... <laughs> here we go. Can, I, can just, I listen to it? But then we don't tell our episode numbers. What good no. is that? It's not on Ugh. there. I'm sorry. It's not on there. I mean, I can't tell you. Okay, it's got that? that music. Why can't you see what episode? Did you have a... We put a post. We put the episode numbers all the way back then. Oh, that's got Clint on it. How the heck am I supposed to know that? Okay. Why uh-huh. didn't Clint be on there? Let me press this one. He only did that like three or four times was Clint ever on this podcast. Why are you pressing play? It's not going to tell you the episode number. I know, but I want to know who's on here. What? That's not the question that's being asked. All the right, now worst. I've lost the plot. It's exasperating. It's All terrible. right, it, I, it's only a. Oh man, no, I think it must be you. All right, we're going on, Greg. <laughs> I'll figure it out later. <laughs> Greg is currently using a JVC RS46 projector, which is a little bit older model that the that is a 1080p and uses uh, HDMI 4.1.4, uh, 4. 4. whatever. Uh, he found a retailer selling B stock JVC X570 units for around two grand. Would that be a worthwhile upgrade? He is in a dedicated theater, completely light controlled, and the screen is acoustically transparent, 120 inch silver ticket, and his main source is an Apple TV 4K. So he's got a, R, a JVC RS46, and this is yes. a JVC X570 unit. Correct. Is this a worthwhile upgrade, Rob? I would say yes. That that's my inclination. At two thousand dollars, great price point. So the the X five seventy has now been replaced by the X five ninety. The five ninety is the current model, and there was no five eighty in between. Don't worry about that. Five seventy and five ninety were only one year apart. The five seventy does have the nice uh, feature where it automatically detects an HDR signal because the unit previous to the five seventy was the five fifty, and the five fifty could do HDR, but you had to manually put it into HDR mode. The five seventy automatically detects HDR signals and automatically puts itself into its HDR mode. So you're getting 4K compatibility. It's the wobble K, but you're getting 4K compatibility. You're getting automatic HDR mode. Um, and it is higher contrast than uh, than your older RS forty six. So for two thousand dollars, if if that's affordable to you, I th- I think that's a terrific deal. Um, what's what's the current prices on the five nineties? They're they're hovering around uh, what three thousand dollars or so. So yeah, 
I think that's a good deal. I think it'd be worthwhile if $2,000 is reasonable to you. I know you're already looking stuff up because... I am not. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out this podcast. That's what I'm. Which that's what I was that. saying. I know that's what you're looking at. Uh, <laughs> I also, am. he says he has an Apple TV 4K, so you've got an HDR source. So, yeah, I think it'd be worthwhile. All right, there you go. I kind of wish those Overstreet. acoustically transparent uh, silver tickets were still around, but they're not. Lots of stuff has gone away from silver ticket. They're like fixed frame white screens. That's what we sell now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's it, the search function is not working right on, on our website. Which yeah, I'm that's, that's it. See, our our website is a horrible place to search for things. I, I don't understand. It just recently broke, though. I didn't break uh-huh. it. it. It just recently changed. Lee ordered uh, Lee Overstreet, who you know from this podcast, mm-hmm. friend of the podcast, but not a friend of Subwoofers. Lee ordered an OLED, <gasps> a 65 inch B7A to be exact. Now read his mind. Is he going to be happy? Is he going to have burn in, vertical banding, blockiness, and dark rays? He used a plasma for many, many years and never had a trace of burn in uh, with the way he had it set up and used. So his OLED will be fine, right? He's going to be fine, right? Uh, this is what I predict. He's going to have the settings all weird and it's going to be way too bright and he's going to think it looks weird and then he's going to call us and then Rob's going to fix him. You think he's going to going to be like Gary and not like what he sees? I, th- I do. I do think that. I think that that's, uh, that's going to uh, that's going to happen at first there. But I, think I don't think that. I, I think you're going to be over the moon, Lee. I think you're going to love this set. Um, so this this is for Lee and for everybody else. So first thing you do, it has an automatic little setup thing that you go through to get it connected to the internet and connected to its remote because the remote has a little pointer function function like a uh, like a Wii remote does. So uh, yeah, there, there's some setup stuff to do. Um, but first thing after all that is done, uh, go to whatever source you're going to use because it does remember which picture mode you're using based on each input and each source. It's a little bit of a quibble I have. I don't. I, I wish there was a way to just be like, use this one picture mode all the time, regardless of what I'm watching. But if you go to Netflix, you'll have to set the picture mode. If you go to YouTube, you'll have to set the picture mode again. When you go to HDMI 1, you'll have to set the picture mode again. So choose something, set your picture mode to ISF Dark Room. Start with that. Right. Even the ISF Dark Room, the OLED light setting is too high. There is no preset where the OLED light setting is low enough, in my opinion. <laughs> but bring it down to about 35, because at 35, the automatic brightness limiter like doesn't do anything anymore because it doesn't need to. So set the OLED light to about 35. If that's too bright, it's fine to go lower, but I wouldn't set it much higher than that. But there you go. That's the first two settings. Now, the only thing I would say, and I already warned Lee about this, but for everyone else too, I do recommend if you're buying an OLED TV, even if it's one of the brand new C8s, do buy it from somewhere where you can return it because there is this vertical banding issue in the dark rays. My OLED has it. I couldn't return it because I bought a refurbished unit and you know all that kind of stuff. And it's not so bad that it like really, really bothers me. But I do have some vertical banding in the dark rays that are enough that I do occasionally spot them during actual content. So ideally, I would have returned that set and got a new one, but I'm like, it's not bad enough that I am going to go through all that. But do check it. So easy way to do it is on YouTube. You can just look for a 5% gray whole screen and a 10% gray whole screen, and you just kind of look at that and go buy your first blush reaction. Uh, Because if your first blush reaction is, I don't see any problems, good, that's great, you're done. Turn it off. Turn it. <laughs> Turn it off right now. If you Quick, examine any OLED TV at a 10% or a 5% gray and you examine it closely, you will see some little vertical bands in there. It's right. unavoidable. They all have it. But your first blush reaction. Now, if you turn it on and you're like, hey, look at that band. That kind of looks bad. Turn it, send it back. Get another one because it is entirely a unit to unit variation. And the majority of them, like 80% of them have that first reaction where like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. And if I examine it really closely, I can make out some. But like 20% of them do have bands on them that you're like, I can clearly see a vertical band on a gray screen. So send that back, get one of the 80%. Simple as that. Uh, the other stuff, if you had no problems with the plasma, you won't have any problems with OLED. Like I say, turn the OLED light setting down to 35 or lower than that. And you're good. You're good. You're going to be happy, Lee. I wouldn't worry about burning or any of that nonsense. If you know how to take care of a TV, you'll be fine as long as you're not abusing it. Uh, Speaking of abusing a TV, I was going to use, I have like extra Y21 to 9 monitor that I got from AOC a while back for review. Okay. And uh, I love that monitor. I've been using that on my computer forever. And I was planning on putting that with the 
the the gaming computer. Yeah. And then recently I asked you for a new monitor for the gaming computer. Yeah. The reason is is because my wife spilled wine on it. And now it's got now it's got a blue line and a green line going up the right side of the thing. Oh, and no. I'm like so irritated. You uh, of all people uses a twenty one by nine monitor. After all the stuff we talk about with projection screens. And you're always like, always getting 16 Oh, I nine. love that thing. I love it because I can snap a 4-3 to one side, a 4-3 to the other, and I can read both things at the same time. Yeah. That's yeah. why I love it. Absolutely. Of all for, people, you have a I love having dual nine. monitors when you're using a computer. I That's mean, true. It just makes it so much easier. Okay, so for the den, Lee wants a new TV that will allow him to share the signal with his OLED in the living room. The new 2018 Vizio E-Series says it supports Dolby Vision and HDR10, and the 43-inch model is only 350, and that size would be fine. So is that the best choice? I think our best choices these days are TLC. TCL. That's what I said. <laughs> um, but... I mean, here at this, so the 43 inch size, um, you wouldn't, there is no um, like uh, full of, well, the E series technically has full array lighting, but it's two zones. That's so one, I half. Really <laughs> one con- half. I don't one really half. consider that local <laughs> dimming, two zones. Uh, whereas the one that's at this price point and this size, 43 inch size from TCL, it would be their five series, would be the S515, and it's also $350. So, but it's edge lit. So price is the same. They both do Dolby Vision. I mean, so how how expensive could Dolby Vision really be? Because they're putting it in three hundred and fifty dollar TVs. Both of these companies. Uh, right. So to me, it really boils down to: Would you prefer to have Roku built in or Chromecast built in? Because the TCL has Roku built in, and the Vizio has Chromecast built in. Other than that, I mean, I, I really wouldn't give the edge in picture quality to one or the other. They're really All about right. the same there. And they both do Dolby Vision, so you can do the thing where both your OLED and this TV could be connected to the same video source, and it'll be no problem. They all talk there the same go. language. So he needs a new AV receiver as well. It's unlikely he'll go up beyond 5.1. Yeah, he's pretending he has a subwoofer that he does not honestly have. Well, and, that's, or, that's, nor that's will he, he buy, no matter what I say. That's right. He needs a new AV receiver too. It's unlikely. Oh, yeah, I already said that. But he clearly wants to handle all the new 4K and HDR stuff. Plus, he wants to be able to uh, use it to send his sources to both the living room and the den. And he'd love to be able to tweak the base to his liking. Now, what base? You got none, son. You can still tweak the base output. He said it's so what model 0, would be his top in? choice? Uh, 34? Is it 34 now? That'd be, that'd be the easy to find currently available model that allows you to send a different source to both zones at the same time. Yeah. Which I, I think X he wants to do. The X3300 or 3400, whichever one you Yeah, the X3300 or the X3400. It is yes, getting pretty hard to find the 33, but you can it's still. Yeah. Got a lot more channels than you need, but it's got the well, multi Q XC32 with sub EQ. It does. It also has a full set of pre-outs if he ever wants to add amplification. There Maybe he just wants to keep using those Yamaha towers and he wants big amps to drive those 15-inch drivers. He's got the full pre-outs. I, I am going to come to his house and I am going to break those speakers. But the big the big that feature is, is the... Don't the ever two, invite me over, Lee. I am breaking your speakers. The two HDMI outputs that are independent HDMI outputs. That's kind of what you need for what you want to do. So you got to step up to that model. And you can use the uh, Odyssey editor app to tweak the sound although tom was having difficulty with his but you can do it yeah uh by the way the podcast that we were listening to that that one was uh number 232 it's called star wars roast okay the earliest one on there that i could find oh and uh it was with liz well maybe the numbers were transposed because he's at 223 but maybe it was 232 it's 232 okay this but maybe i transposed it somehow i don't know anywho uh I messed it up. Yeah, no, it's 232. Okay. So, Joseph, this is our last one for today. Joseph, last week we talked about Joseph's computer, the NVIDIA GTX uh, 1050 graphics card connected to his LG B7 OLED and how he was getting stuttery when he tried to send 4K resolution. Rob made some suggestions for changing the input settings on this OLED and possibly changing the frame rate setting on this PC, and that did the trick. Yay! And he's... Now, he's now getting 4K and HDR playback via Plex now. And for anyone else who might be having choppy playback while using Plex on an LG OLED, Jim wrote to say that he was having the issue, that issue until he turned off true 
motion. So look for that, set it to off. He was also using uh, the recommended settings for of true motion set to user, but then having both sliders, D jutter and D blur, set to zero so there wouldn't be any soap opera effect, but that resulted in choppiness until he set the true motion to off completely. So all right, but it's certainly worth a try. That's a setting in inside of your TV. So, so. Th yeah. this that th this question comes from Joseph, but that suggestion came from Jim. So That's right. Confused, but they Two were very people. related, so the put them together yeah. there. Two different people. So for Joseph, he now has a new issue. Joseph has a Yamaha RX A thirty fifty receiver, and he can't seem to get HDMI ARC to work. He followed the instructions and turned on HDMI CEC both in his Yamaha and his B seven OLED, but no dice. Not only that. With his Yamaha's uh, uh, ARC HDMI output plugged into his uh, LG's ARC HDMI input, he can't even get Yamaha's on-screen menu to show up. So in these suggestions, the forum and Google have been no help. No, I got nothing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll address the video side first. Because, so we know he was trying to get his uh, computer graphics card to output uh, 4K and HDR to his television. Right. So to do that, he would have had to have turned on the HDMI deep color for the HDMI right. input he was using, and he would have had to have set that input uh, under the input settings to the PC icon so that it can accept the full 444 signal. Sure. That's what we said last week to do. And that was the thing that fixed his playback problem in his video, so that's good. The downside of that is <laughs> the on-screen menu output of the Yamaha uh, is one of the things that isn't compatible when you've activated HDMI deep color on that input. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, actually, to that's, be that's, honest with you. That's one yeah. of those things where you have to have turned off the HDMI deep color to send the on-screen menu out of the AV receiver. So unfortunately, if you've plugged the computer into the Yamaha and then the Yamaha into the TV, uh, this, this creates a problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> because obviously that's going to be plugged into the one input that needs to be set to HDMI deep color and 444 for the computer to work, but then your on-screen menu doesn't work. I suppose you could use the second HDMI output because the A3050 most definitely has. Right. Uh, it has cool. three HDMI outputs. Ooh. So you can use one of the other HDMI outputs to go to a different input on the LG and use that like just for your on-screen menu, I guess. Kind of... Kind of silly, but at least no yeah. function. And if it's on, close by. It's not a long cable. That's right. Thing. And on that second HDMI uh, input, you'd want to make sure you keep the HDMI deep color off. And then you'll get your on-screen menu back. Now, for the audio return channel, uh, I had a bit of an issue getting this to work on my Marantz, so I don't have a Yamaha to test it directly with, but I don't imagine it's worlds apart. Because, so, you first go in and you go into your television. And you tell your television uh, that the sound output, so there's the sound menu, and you tell right. it that the sound output is going to be HDMI audio return channel. That seems sure. straightforward enough. When you do that, it will automatically change some other settings behind the scenes that are only accessible if you go to the LG's general settings menu. Sure, why not? That's and everything in the general settings menu is named very strangely. So I, off the top of my head, I'm sorry, I don't even recall what the thing was called. But there, you go through all there because there's like HDMI settings and there's output settings and there's like to, to update the firmware, you have to go to about this TV because they couldn't just put firmware somewhere in the menu. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's stupid look through everything in that general menu because there's a thing in there that activates HDMI CEC when you turn on audio return channel, and that does need to be active. But then there's also a separate HDMI CEC power setting, which is like, do you turn everything connected to this device on and off when the TV turns on and off? Uh -huh. And by default, that gets set to on, and you want it off. Why would that have any bearing on any of the things? Because, well, in the case of my Marantz, if it was on... They got these weird conflicting things because the Marantz also tries to turn on the TV, you see. Right. So they're both trying to turn each other on. Sounds like yeah. a good time. They just need a couple of drinks to get you, along. You'd think. But uh, <laughs> but but you really want to kind of turn that off. So the thing that's like the automatic power on off yeah. thing. Yeah. And you got to dig through the general menu to find you want to turn that sucker off. Uh, once I did that, mine seemed to work. But there was one more wrinkle, which was that. Obviously, what you want to do is, let's say you're watching Netflix and you're using the Netflix app that's built into the OLED. Sure. Because that's the way you can get both Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. I'm assuming sure. that's what he wants to do. And you have to use the audio return Ooh. channel to do that. 
So you go to Netflix and you want your receiver to then automatically go to the audio return channel input. Yes, that would yes. make sense. Well, that's what it does. That That's fine. And then it stays there. <laughs> Even if you go to an HDMI input, like you tell your receiver to go back to your Blu-ray player or whatever, still stuck on the TV's audio <laughs> until you press the actual like input button on your AV receiver. At least it was in the case of my Marantz. Um so yeah, the audio return channel and HDMI CEC are a bag of hurt, but I think it's that power setting because it was in my case. And okay. by default, it's turned on and it doesn't work. So there you go. So what you're basically telling me from what I can glean from this conversation is yeah. that uh, we should all just wait until the Dolby Atmos and everything works on everybody else's app so we can stop having to use the LG built-in app because it, that is just suck. Yeah, it's just I mean, the terrible. enhanced audio return channel is supposed to be separate from CEC because surprise, surprise, integrators don't like it this way. <laughs> you think that <laughs> results in a few phone calls to integrators when they're trying to do this crap? Oh, gosh. Yeah, this but, sounds like a nightmare. I'll be honest with you. It sounds like an absolute nightmare. So, But you, yes. you, you won't be able to is. upgrade to enhanced audio return channel with any of the gear you mentioned. So that that's not really a solution. Yeah. No. Fun times. <sighs> Thank you, HDMI. You've just I made know. everything so much better. It's May so I have easy. I'll just plug <laughs> it into a sound bar. It it's a work. single cable solution. Your <laughs> life is going to be perfect. Yeah. Uh -huh. You have sold us a bag of goods, sir. Do not appreciate it. All right, that's the last. What else we got? Who's who's next? Who's for next week? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, I already did the scrolling thing. How dumb am I? Uh, oh. We got Aiden. Aiden, Aiden is uh, left. And then we also got a question from uh, Marlon, but that uh, came in like late last night or early this morning. So you're on the right. list for next week. All right. Uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Zachary for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. Thank you very much, Zachary. Yeah, Zachary, thank you for the donation. Thank you to our 61 patrons over at Patreon. They are leaving us a monthly donation that's being taken from them, given to Patreon, and a portion of it's given to us. And all that money goes into our coffers to help pay for our hosting fees and all the other things that we pay for. So thank you, uh, patrons. Yeah, that's uh, patreon.com slash Podcast, And thanks so much to our 61 patrons. I want to thank Nathan for talking us up to Power Sound Audio and Jason for uh, his R mentioning us in his review on the SVS website, as well as Chris for his Isteon Hub giveaway. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Chris. If you'd like to win that it's Isteon Hub, uh, email Tom, tom at avrant.com. Tell him why you want the thing. There you go. Uh, June 30th, right? June 30th is the cutoff yeah, date for that. Midnight, my time. There you go. Ish. So... <laughs> Date has to say June 30th on Tom's email. That's right, on my email. That's right. I get it. All right. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.